All right, guys, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by the Ozone Generator from TrulyHeal.com. This is Marcus Freudenman, who's been on our show, episode 490. And ozone therapy, as you probably heard, is an amazing, amazing way to help your body to heal. And it strengthens your immune system. It's great for killing bacteria and viruses. It increases the oxygen level of your cells, and it also helps to detoxify your body and reduces inflammation. It has been used with people on HIV, and it can affect cancer cells. We can't make any claims. Uh, but it's anti-aging. It increases energy. It reduces acidity. And people have used it for diabetic ulcers, herniated discs, men meniscus tears in their knees, shingles, allergies, Lyme disease, Alzheimer's, arthritis, autoimmune diseases, colitis, digestive issues, tinnitus, vaginal infections, chronic hepatitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, candida, and so many more. So if you guys are interested in the Ozo machine from Truly Healed that I highly recommend, I'll put a link to that on this show page. And we're also brought to you by the Relax Far Infrared Sauna. This is my favorite sauna. I love this thing. I've been using it every day for about four years now, about five days a week on average. And it helps to increase heat shock proteins, helps to increase circulation, helps to detoxify your lymphatic system. Uh, it helps to remove toxins, chemicals, heavy metals, waste, poisons from your fat cells because that's where all these things go is they end up in your fat cells. And so the Relax Far Infrared Sauna is an amazing tool. It's it's great because it's portable. It's cost effective. It doesn't cost you two, three, four thousand dollars. You can lend it to a friend. It's portable. Like I said, you don't have to break down a wall. It uses far infrared heat. It's very, very low EMF. This is just an incredible machine. And I use it every day. You sweat like crazy and it turns on immediately. So it takes no time to preheat. It's my favorite health tool. I love it so much. So if you want to get access to the Relax Far Infrared Sauna, or the ozone generator that I talked about, you can go to extremehealthradio.com slash 507, and they're both available in our store as well. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on another episode of Extreme Health Radio. Super, super excited to be with you today. We got a cool guy on the show again. This is uh, Chris Work, and uh, if you guys have been following his work, he's got a really cool blog over at crispycancer.com, doing some great work, um, survivor of uh, colon cancer. So we're going to be talking about his new program that he's launching here pretty soon. Uh, we're going to be talking about his journey, and um, as many of you guys know, I got started in this whole sort of alternative health, uh, natural nutrition, and all of this um, same sort of stuff as Chris is uh, through my mom's cancer diagnosis back in 1995. So as a result of that, that's what initially got me started in, uh, in you know, natural therapies for things, and my mom had... Um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and she was she almost died she had a, st a stem cell transplant bone marrow transplant chemotherapy surgery radiation the whole nine yards and uh, it was just a really eye-opening time for me back in 1995 going through all that stuff with her so uh, cancer as many of you guys know affects so many of us um, I think it's one out of every two men get a diagnosis in today's culture in today's society one out of every three women if you yourself haven't been diagnosed with cancer, I, I'm sure you know someone who has, and uh, it's um, it's the great curse of our time, which is unreal what's happening with uh, cancer these days. So Chris has got a really awesome story, and he's launching a um, brand new course for people called Square One, so I wanted to make sure that we can talk to him today about his journey and, um, and his new course and program that he's got starting up pretty soon. So really, really excited. Again, his website is called crispycancer.com. And let me turn his microphone up so we can hear him. Chris, can you hear us okay? can hear you great, Justin. How are you? Excellent, man. You know what? I was just looking before the show. You know, it's been four years since you've been on? That seems longer than I would have guessed. <laughs> I know, right? I would have guessed like two, or two to three years. Oh, time just flies, doesn't it? It does, man. It, I'm just glad you're still doing the show. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. You were our 12th guest, so uh, thanks for, for being <laughs> oh, on. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, man. That was 
that was in the infancy. I know, I know, and I love what you have going on, man. Uh, you have so many cool things going on in your on your website, and you're doing some great stuff. And uh, when I heard that you were going to be launching this program, uh, Square One, it just it hits it's hits so home to me because, gosh, I could probably rattle off um, ten ten to fifteen people that I know in my personal life right now who have had cancer or are dealing with cancer and. Everyone that I talk to or that my wife Kate talks to, they're just overwhelmed. Like they get that diagnosis and they're just completely overwhelmed. So I'm super yeah. excited that you're launching this course. But yeah, thanks, man. I know it's, uh, you know, <clears throat> the biggest problem that cancer patients have is they, you know, obviously it, it, it comes out of nowhere most of the time. Mm -hmm. And when you get the diagnosis, your entire life stops, mm -hmm. right? Your life as you know it, as you know it, is over. And uh, usually you're thrust into treatments before you really have time to think. Mm -hmm. Most cancer patients, you know, they get a diagnosis and the doctors want to get them into surgery, chemo, or radiation treatments the next day. I mean, it's that fast. Isn't that crazy? The chemo train, yeah, is a high-speed train. Yeah, it's and, nice. um and so, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of patients are just, your life's a whirlwind after diagnosis, and you are, a lot of fear and anxiety and confusion, and you're just, you know, you just are rushed into things that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the biggest problem that cancer patients have right in the beginning is ignorance, mm -hmm. because they just, they just don't know what they don't know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They don't know what the treatments are going to be like. They don't know the risks. They don't know the side effects. They don't know what kind of long-term damage the treatments have. They don't know the success rates. And usually doctors, unfortunately, tell patients too little because the doctors are really busy and they kind of want to get the signal. Mm -hmm. And so they'll tell them, you know, yeah, you know, you need chemo. You don't need surgery. You need going to need chemo. Um, this is how many treatments of chemo you're going to get in three months. And yes, you're going to lose your hair and, you know, you're, you're going to feel nauseous. So you need to make sure you eat a lot of calories. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you eat, but eat a lot of calories like milkshakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's about it. That's right? crazy. They, they just don't tell them anything that's, you know, critically important to make an informed decision. Yeah. And I actually created a free guide for cancer patients. It's called 20 Questions for Your Oncologist. Yeah, you and, know, I was going to ask you about that. Is that a guide yeah. to, is that, like, if someone were to ask their question, their, those, their oncologist those questions, would they, would the oncologist immediately write them off or get angry that they would ask those questions? Do you think? No, not necessarily. I mean, here's the thing, and you can link to this in the show notes or whatever if you want. I hope you do, because um, these questions are so important. I mean, some, and I can touch on just a few here. Uh, and actually, you know, truth be told, the, the guide is it's more than 20 questions, right? Uh -huh. I just call it 20 questions because it's memorable, but it's, it's actually a lot more than that. And most cancer patients are not going to ask every question in this guide. It's, a, it's an hour-long audio program that I've created with a transcript and everything. It's free. But like, like one question that a lot of cancer patients don't even think to ask or even know mm -hmm. is, is this treatment you're recommending palliative or curative? Now, most regular people don't even know what the word palliative means. Mm -hmm. And so an oncologist may even say, well, this is palliative care, and not explain what palliative is, right? So they may mention it, not explain it, or they may not even mention it at all. Mm -hmm. So curative means that they believe, based on the evidence, that this chemotherapy treatment could cure the cancer. Palliative means we know this cancer is not curable, you know, you're stage three or four, uh -huh. but we're going to give you chemo anyway, because maybe it'll slow it down a little uh, and buy you some more time. Uh -huh. And give you a little bit of like quality of life for the remaining time you do have, right? Well, you know, quality of life is a, is a term that they use often. I mean, how good is your quality of life being pulled, throwing up, diarrhea, in bed, losing weight, that, that's, that's not a very good quality of life. Right, And that's right. from the chemo, right? So, um, yeah, but they do say, you know, uh, we want to give you this to increase your um, 
so you'll live longer and have a better quality of life. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so that's just one question, right? And um, there was a study recently where they found that three-fourths uh, of late-stage mm-hmm. cancer patients surveyed did not know whether or not they were getting palliative or curative care. Three quarters. Yeah. I mean, it was, it's unbelievable. Like they didn't even know. Wow. They actually thought the treatments they were getting could cure them. When the truth was their doctors knew like, no, there's no way these we're giving them palliative chemo. We're not giving them curative chemo. Wow. So that's how bad, the ignorance is mm-hmm. and not to blame the patient. Cause we think of the word ignorance as being an insult, but ignorance just means you don't know something, right? right? Nothing wrong with that. So yeah, yeah. Nothing wrong with it at mm-hmm. all. You just don't know. Oh, no, like I said, so uh, patients are going in completely blind and they, they don't know the right questions to ask and they're scared. And all they're asking is, am I going to be sick? Am I going to lose my hair? Mm-hmm. And you really need to ask, what is the success rate? Like, what is the five-year overall survival rate with this treatment for my stage cancer, for my type of stage cancer? Right. right? So, they need to be asking that question. So that question is um, interesting. They need to ask their oncologist, how many patients have you successfully cured with my type and stage of cancer? Uh, right? Yeah. How many right. have you actually cured? Mm-hmm. And may I speak with them? Like, I would really like to talk to some of your former patients. Oh, wow. Would you would would you mind referring me to to three or four of them? I just want to, you know, I just need some people to talk to. Uh-huh. So these are not antagonistic questions, right? These are reasonable questions. Now, some of the questions do get a, lint, a little antagonistic. Like, for example, um, how much money do you make off of me as a patient? Uh. That's a pretty bold question. <laughs> a lot of people don't have don't have the you know are not comfortable asking that question. Wow, but yeah. But some people do. Some people do. And, have, and, you, and you, have you talked with people who have asked that question, and what, what was the response from doctors? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. So I get feedback all the time from patients who use the guide. And they, I mean, the stories they tell me are just un- unbelievable. I mean, basically, it's the same thing. It's like, wow. you wouldn't believe what my doctor said to me when I asked him these questions. Now, oh. sometimes... Again, some of the questions are very, it starts off, they start off pretty just really basic, you know, in, you know, fact finding information gathering questions, uh-huh, but right. then it can progress to some very pointed direct questions, you know, like if this was your wife, would you recommend the same treatment for her uh-huh. as you're recommending for me? Those kind of questions. So, but what happens is doctors don't like to be questioned. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't mind answering a few questions, but you really start asking detailed questions, they get uncomfortable right. because the an- they know the answers are difficult. And they've admitted, even the study I mentioned where they surveyed all the patients, and the, you know, three, three-fourths of the patients didn't know what kind of treatment they were getting. They also surveyed the doctors. Mm. And the doctor said, because they asked them, wh- why, why do these patients not know? And the doctors admitted, because we're uncomfort- uncomfortable discussing those type of things with patients. Wow. It's hard to tell a patient they're incurable. Right. That's what doctors, that's how they, you know, how they answer these surveys. So again, not to paint the doctors as bad people, but they're uncomfortable delivering bad news. Mm -hmm. They want to just go over it and they want to get the patient in and out quickly because they have a lot of other patients that need to see. So that's the real, you know, the real problem there. It's not that these are just evil people. They're just busy and they're uncomfortable with, Telling, delivering bad news. And so you end up with patients agreeing to treatments thinking they're going to help them when the odds are for most cancers, especially solid tumor type cancers, the odds are these treatments are not going to help you and your survival odds are very low. Um, it's one of the most important s- statistics, I think, in, in the world of cancer treatment that most people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, they're reasonable. The fact- so sorry, yeah, they're reasonable questions because like you said, I mean, if someone were to go and buy a car or go buy some clothes, I mean, it's like, you know, asking a ton of questions. But th- but these are questions about your health, and these are questions about, you know, industry and what's going to happen to you and life and death. I mean, 
if you're, uh, it seems like in my mind, if the doctor were to be, if you ask these questions, let's say you ask five or six of them in a very nice way and you didn't ask the really kind of um, antagonistic questions, if there are any, if you ask really nice questions in a really nice way and the doctor still gets upset, that should, that should really be an indicator, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, so what happens is it's, it's very common that, and I talked about this in the guide. I said, listen, if you have a, if you have a really good doctor that really does care, uh-huh. they will give you all the time you want, and they will answer the questions, you know, uh, uh, in a way that is kind and compassionate. Mm-hmm. But if you have a doctor that's arrogant and they really don't care about people, they will get very short with you and agitated when you ask difficult questions. Mm-hmm. and they will, you know, they might even fire you as a patient, mm-hmm. which is good because, you, you know, you don't want to want to work with somebody like that anyway. Right. But what I was saying a minute ago is that, you know, one of the, the most important statistics, I think, in the, in the world of cancer that most people don't know is that the overall death rate from cancer has only come down 5% in the last 60 years. Wow. So you cut out 5%. there for a second. So you cut out there. You said the overall something of cancer, your phone line just went out for a little second. The overall death rate oh. from cancer in the United States has only come down 5% in the last 60 years. Whoa. Now, it's come down about 20% since the early 90s because it peaked in the early 90s. Okay. So the statistic that you see in the news is... Uh, the cancer is down 20% since 1991. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, it's only down 5% since the 1950s. Wow. So that tells you we have made little progress in curing cancer, despite the hundreds of billions that have been spent on cancer research. The only cancers that they've made really significant Strides in are, are childhood leukemia, lymphomas, mm-hmm. and testicular cancer. Mm-hmm. But our main cancer killers, breast, colon, lung, prostate, ovarian, cervical, pancreatic, they've made almost zero progress wow. in improving the death rate. There's all kinds of statistics out there that they throw at you, but the real one that matters is the death rate. How many people per 100 are dying of X type of cancer per year. Mm -hmm. And that is is basically unchanged. So, um, yeah, there's statistics about five years surviving longer are are increasing because they diagnose people earlier, Mm -hmm. uh, which skews the numbers there, and they over-diagnose cancers. So when they diagnose someone with stage zero breast cancer or thousands of women with stage zero cancer and then throw them in a statistical pool with stage one, two, three, and four breast cancer, Mm. then of course it makes all of it look better, right? Mm -hmm. Stage zero, I mean, that cancer is not going to spread. And so all of, you know, 99% of the stage zero survivors live 10 years or more. Mm -hmm. So it makes the state, it makes it look like all breast cancer survivors are living longer. Follow me? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I was just listening to a story the other day where someone was diagnosed with stage zero, uh, cancer. So, um, I think after they removed something, all the margins were clean, everything was fine, but they still gave her a stage zero cancer. And kind of similar to what you went through is after they did that, um, they wanted her to go through like 30 rounds of radiation or something insane. Yeah. Oh, that's oh, yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And stage zero, I mean, is a slow-growing, precancerous condition. It's not even cancer when we're talking about stage zero breast cancer. Right. And there is a movement within the cancer industry to reclassify stage zero as not cancer, right? To stop telling patients they have cancer when it's the stage zero situation. Why would they do that? Um, that it seems like it would make sense to have the stage be called cancer because then you can get people to do chemo. Well, that's why they do it. <laughs> But there are some very ethical doctors that are saying, we're over-treating patients. We're over-diagnosing, we're treating patients for a condition that is not life-threatening. Stage zero is not cancer. Right. 
same thing is happening with prostate cancer and thyroid cancer. They're wow. both grossly overdiagnosed and, and overtreated. So, yeah, you got women getting mastectomies and radiation and all kinds of crazy treatment for stage zero, something that was likely to never cause them any harm. Now, I've heard so, a few times... It's, it's, a messed up, it's, it's a messed up system. Oh, it's, completely, it's completely messed up. I, I've heard a few times that um, from different people we've had on is that you know, the human body and you know, over the course of the average lifespan, the, 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 the body will actually go through a significant cancer uh, issue three or four times and, and the, person, the person's body, it heals it and the person never even knows they had it. Yeah, that's... that's um relatively well-known in the medical community or mm. scientific research community that, um, you know, autopsies have shown, consistently show, that uh, people will have a cancer come and go in their lifetime yep. that they didn't even know about, mm-hmm. right? So they'll have a lump or a bump or a tumor or a lesion form for, and be in their body for a period of months or years, but, they, just, you know, it's not enough symptoms for them to get go check, check out by the doctor or whatever, and they may not feel any pain at all. Mm. And eventually the body resolves it, the body heals it. So we created it, the body can heal it. And, um, you know, that's the big, that's probably my biggest message mm. uh, to the world is that, you know, cancer can be healed, the body can heal it, but you have to change. Sometimes it can heal it and you didn't even do anything, right? Mm-hmm. You didn't even know it. But um, if you have a cancer and you know you have cancer, then in order to heal cancer, you really have to change your whole life. So, so for, I don't promote magic bullets. I don't promote quick fixes or sort of these like quack cures. I promote radical diet and life change. I mean, mm-hmm. you everything because there's so many factors in our world that can be working against you. And cancer in a lot of ways is kind of like the death of a thousand cuts, mm-hmm. right? You've got a healthy, toxic diet. You've got... Uh, you may have toxic environments, so you may work in a toxic situation, like you may work in a factory, right? You're inhaling fumes or smoke. If you're a hairdresser, you're inhaling all these chemical fumes from from dyes and bleaches and straighteners, right? Yeah. Or you're working in a, some kind of industrial factory, or maybe you live downtown and there's a lot of pollution uh, right. in your, your neighborhood. You're breathing pollution every day, um, and you're using toxic body care products. So there's all these little factors, right? that are unnatural man-made chemicals that are in our body. We're breathing them in, that we're eating them in processed foods because artificial flavors, colors, preservatives, additives, all this junk. Mm-hmm. We're putting them on our skin. And all of this stuff is synergistically toxic, right? I mean, you just got, we just, your body becomes a chemical soup and that chemical creates inflammation, irritation and DNA damage, free radicals, and of, over time, and especially if you're under a lot of stress, because stress suppresses your immune system. Mm. So over time, you've got all these factors coming at you from every different direction, right? Beating you down. Like I said, death of a thousand cuts. And eventually, your body becomes uh, weakened and immunocompromised. Your immune system is suppressed and overloaded. And your body becomes a place where cancer cells can thrive. Mm what we call become hospitable to cancer. Mm -hmm. So you can't turn that around with like, you know, a magic tea or something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, you have to, you you have to like put your whole life on the table. Right. And like change everything. Yeah. Because you don't know, you know, it's not just one thing that's making you sick. Although we do know there are singular causes. Right. Um, But even when there are singular causes, there are still people with the same exposure to get cancer. For example, everybody knows the story of Aaron Brockovich, uh-huh. right? Right. So there was a there was a chemical company dumping hexavalent chromium uh, illegally, and it contaminated the water supply, and they, it became a cancer cluster. And so a lot of people in this little town got cancer because they, they, you know, the water was polluted. But not everybody got cancer, right? Not everybody got it, even though they were all exposed. So even though that, that was a singular cause of cancer, your immune system and your body, depending on your diet and your lifestyle and your stress level and other factors, uh-huh. can still protect you. So, you know, it's important to bring that up because people tend to get, you know, 
they tend to get freaked out and think like, oh, everything causes cancer. Uh, like, I might as well give up. Yeah. No, like, don't give up. Like, your choices matter. Your choices matter. And uh-huh. so your diet and lifestyle and your attitude and stress can be protective against the unknown stuff, right? Mm-hmm. The environmental pollution and different things that, you, you know, that you just really can't control. And you just control what you can and then... Hopefully, I mean, the odds are it'll protect you mm-hmm. from the rest. Yeah, so I, like like, what, I like what you're saying about, um, you know, just these magic sort of bullets that people have, um, even in the alternative world, you know, it's, uh, I just, I like what you're saying there because cancer is an opportunity to completely change the entire direction of the, of your life and what you're doing. And, uh, and it's not like, absolutely. You know, so many times people, you know, they just want to take a pill for a headache or, a, you know, or a vaccine for a flu shot instead of actively working on building their immune system their, you know, their whole life and working on doing things that facilitate their immune system. They want to just get a flu shot because it's easy and they want to take chemotherapy. It's not easy, but when they're coerced into it through fear, um, it it really goes down to I like what you're saying, though, because it, it, it it's an invitation for someone to completely radically change their entire life and not a lot of people or I would say a lot of people are scared to do that that's right well <clears throat> there's a few reasons one we've been conditioned to put our faith in a magic bullet and that magic bullet is a pharmaceutical drug right that's how we've been raised that there's a pill for every ill mm-hmm. and so it's hard to break out of that mentality and people carry that mentality over into the, you know, natural and alternative world. So they're like, well, I mean, can I just take an herb instead of that drug? <laughs> can I just take one magic herb? No, it just doesn't work that way. Right. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's possible, right? It's possible. There are testimonials of people healing cancer by just changing one thing. But I think that's a, it's a lazy and it's, a, it's sort of a foolish approach mm-hmm. to think you're just going to do one, take one little herb or drink some special tea or uh, you know, eat some special anti-cancer food and it's going to cure you. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, like you said, and I said, cancer is, a, it's, it's a, an opportunity for you to change your whole life. Mm-hmm. And it, you're not sick because you have cancer. You have cancer because you're sick mm-hmm. and cancer has been growing in your body for years. You didn't get it overnight and you're not going to heal it overnight, mm-hmm. right? Healing takes time. <laughs> And a lot of people are impatient, mm-hmm. so they don't want to, you know, again, they want the quick fix. They don't want to do the hard work, which is changing your whole life, mm-hmm. giving up your bad habits and forgiving the people that have hurt you. And, you know, when I say bad habits, I mean, you know, eating junk food and fast food and processed food in the diet that's you know, a gluttonous diet of meat and dairy, mm-hmm. like nowhere <laughs> in history we're eating unprecedented levels of animals. Right. And it's, it's just bananas. It's crazy. Uh, and not to mention that, you know, everybody wants to blame processed food and fast food, and of course it's terrible, but most processed food and fast food also contains animal products. Uh-huh. So it's both. Yeah, it's completely unnatural. Hey, I wanted to um, let people know um, about your story, because, you know, a lot of people that are listening now may not have gone back and listened to the show we did with you for, four, you know, four years ago. Um, talk a little bit about that, uh, about how things were going in your life and, uh, what was going on and then your, your story through cancer yourself. Yeah. Well, I actually, my story is different. I rewrote it since then. Nice. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> when I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer when I was 26. Okay. And, uh, you know, like a typical cancer patient, I was rushed into surgery. They wanted to get me in surgery a couple of days after my diagnosis. I mean, just right away, like I said at the beginning of this talk. Wow. And I did postpone it a week because it was two days before Christmas when I got diagnosed. Oh, man. So they postponed the surgery. I go in. They take out a third of my colon, take out the tumor, take out a bunch of lymph nodes. And I woke up and they said, it's worse than we thought. You're stage 3C. You're going to need 9 to 12 months of chemotherapy. And... A couple things happened in the hospital that got the wheels turning. One was the first meal they served me after cutting out a third of my large intestine, right, and stitching it back together. Do you remember what it was, Justin? 
You know what? I think it was like a green jello. Was that right? <laughs> no. It was a sloppy joe. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It was a sloppy joe. They served me a sloppy joe. The first meal, after cutting me open, splitting me open, cut, taking out some guts, sewing me back together. And I just remember being like, in the world, like, why are they serving me a sloppy joe? This is the worst cafeteria food pretty much you can think of, wow. right? Like, it's sort of like textbook cafeteria food from summer camp or like what they maybe fed the military in 1955. Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you know how bad a sloppy Joe is. They don't even serve them in restaurants. No, no, that's like, so they crazy. They don't serve it in restaurants because nobody wants to eat one. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was the first meal, which made me think, this is terrible. Like, so, did, why in the world are they serving this to sick people? Did you eat it? Yeah, man, I hadn't eaten in several days, yeah, so I yeah. ate not all of it, but you know, I was hungry. I ate some of it. Right. And it wasn't good. <laughs> and yeah, there was probably some jello in there too on the plate. Probably some green jello on the plate or something. Oh, I, I don't remember. I was crazy. I was on heavy medication. Yeah. Heavy <laughs> drug. Wow. Really good drug. Mm. So then the uh, the other thing that happened in the hospital was the day I was leaving, the surgeon came in to see me one more final one final time and uh -huh. and I said, "Hey, uh, you know, are there any foods I need to avoid?" Because, again, I was like, I didn't want to eat the wrong thing and screw up the surgery. I mean, they, they cut my guts open, right? And all the food I eat is going to pass through there. So, like, you know, is hot sauce going to melt the stitches or, you know, right. Doritos too sharp? <laughs> like, you know, like, what, what, what can I, am I, can I eat whatever I want? So, basically, I said, yeah, you know, is there any food I need to, to like, avoid? And he was like, nah, just don't lift anything heavier than a beer. No way. Yeah. That's all he said. Wow. And I was just kind of like, oh, huh, like, okay. Wow. And uh, so that was red flag number two. Yeah. That kind of got, again, got the wheels turning, and I'm thinking, like, what is the, why is there such a disconnect between, like, you know, health food? Like, why don't they have, like, healthier food in hospitals? And I, and I wasn't, like, a health food guy no. at all. But, you know, I was instinctively, right? I'm a very instinctive person. And so, you know, when something like, you know, doesn't jive with my instincts, I'm going to be like, wait a minute, like, what's, what's up here? Wow. So, um, I go, you know, <clears throat> I go home and my wife and I are, you know, I'm, I'm on the couch recovering, sleeping on the couch because, you know, I had these stitches and it was hard to move around the house. So mm -hmm. for a few days, but <clears throat> Right after we got home, my wife and I, uh, you know, we're Christians, we're believers, and, you know, we, we had been praying the whole time. I mean, one of the first verses that I was thought about when I was diagnosed was that God works all things for the good of those who love Him, mm. who are called according to His purpose. And I just thought, you know, I really don't understand this, and I, I really, really wish this was not my life, yeah. you know, because... You know, it's funny, some people are like, cancer was, was such a blessing. <laughs> cancer was a gift. I know, right? And I do not agree with that, yeah. <laughs> okay? Like, <laughs> a gift is something you want, <laughs> you yeah. know? A blessing is something that brings you joy and happiness. Yeah. It was neither of those for me, yeah. right? It was a nightmare. I would not wish it on anyone. Yeah. But, it, you know, again, I, this is a part where I really had to exercise my faith, and I was like, okay, well, God, you know, the Bible says that God works all things for the good of those who love him, so right. I'm just going to believe and trust that you're going to work this for my good somehow. Like, I don't, I don't understand how. I can't even imagine how. But that was, the, you know, one of the first verses I thought of, and it, it did give me a, some encouragement, right? And I just decided I'm going to stand, I'm just going to hold on to this you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we get home from the hospital. My wife and I pray. You know, one prayed a lot, but on one specific occasion, one day we were on the couch and we were praying, and, and I said, uh, you know, I was just like, I was just thinking about chemotherapy in my life, and you know what what was coming next, and the idea of chemo, like it just didn't make sense to me. I just was really struggling, wow. like with you know, thinking about myself going through that and becoming a chemo patient and mm -hmm. what it would do to me. And I really felt, I felt really weak and really vulnerable. Uh. And I just had this deep, 
internal resistance to it, you know, just kind of like danger, do not do that, wow. right? Wow. Like, I just felt like it was not, it was going to go really badly for me because I felt so weak. And anyway, so I had this conflict that I didn't know what to do. And so I, my wife and I were praying, and I was just like, God, if there's another way besides chemotherapy, please show me. Mm-hmm. No, I just, I don't know what to do. And two days later, I got a book that was mailed to me from a man in Alaska. And, you know, I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, and this guy sends me a book. Uh, he knew my dad, business acquaintance of my dad. Wow. And he did a very bold thing. And he sent me a, you know, pretty controversial book called God's Way to Ultimate Health, which was basically written by a guy who healed his colon cancer with a raw food diet. Wow. And so, you know, two days later, this book shows up, and I open the box, and it says, God's Way to Ultimate Health. And I'm like, God's Way? Okay, let's see what this is about. Right. And, I, you know, as soon as I read the guy's story, and I'm just kind of reading, you know, in the first chapter, he's like telling a story, and, and I, man, I just got choked up, you know? I was overcome with emotion. I'm on the couch, at home alone. My wife's at work, and I'm just like, you know choked up, tears coming down my face, and I just knew it was an answer to prayer. There was just no doubt. I was like, this is it. Like, I asked for something, and here it is. Like, this showed up, and this is what I got to do. And so, you know, this is a book that, that like a lot of, uh, you know, health books, made the case for nutrition, Mm -hmm. Uh, made the case that the reason so many of us are sick and suffering from diseases like cancer is not bad luck or bad genes, right? It's our diet and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I've learned since then, of course, that cancer rates are much lower in most of the world uh, compared to the United States and Western nations. And third world countries have much lower rates of colon cancer than the U.S. And it's because they eat a very different diet Mm -hmm. and their lifestyle is different too. Mm -hmm. So, Anyway, so, uh, you know, as I'm, this book is just really speaking to me at, at that time, and, uh, and he's making the case that we just need to get back to a simple diet of organic, you know, he's saying raw, organic fruits and vegetables. Wow. That's it. And lots of carrot juice. Because <laughs> that's what he did to heal his cancer. It took him about a year. And he didn't have surgery or anything. So I'm like, wow, man, if this guy did it, and, and at that time, you know, everybody knows what the raw food diet is now. But this was January 2004, and I promise you, nobody knew what the raw food diet was. Like, well, I had never heard of it. Well, when did this guy and, write the book? Do you know? Probably even before that. Well, he was diagnosed back in the 1970s. Oh, my gosh. And and so this was 2004, and, he, and he's still alive today, 2017. George Malcolmus, I just found out, right? Yeah, George Malcolmus. Yeah. So, and he's like probably close to 90, maybe in his 90s now. Wow. So I uh, just, it, I just, it resonated with me and yeah. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. So, you know, I call my wife and I'm trying to explain to her. I'm really excited, you know, I'm trying to explain to her. I got this book and like, you're not going to believe this and the, the raw food diet and juice. Like we got to find a juicer, you know, and she's probably, she's just like going, what are you talking about? Oh, like, you know, gosh. I'm talking 90 miles an hour. I'm sure. <laughs> And she's like, you're still going to do, right? And I'm like, no, I don't want to do chemo. Like, it's poisonous. And you know what it does to your body? It destroys your immune system. Like, you know, I learned a few things from, you know, I don't know, chapter three of the book or something, right? And uh, That's funny. So, uh, (laughs) you know, as soon as we get off the phone, I'm getting phone calls from other family members who are saying, Chris, you know, we heard that you're thinking about not doing chemotherapy. And you need to understand how serious this is. And you need to do exactly what the doctor says. Wow. Even your own family was saying that to you. Oh, yeah. Don't you think that if there was something better, the doctors would be using it? And, you know, I know somebody that tried alternative therapies and they died. Right, right. And all of a sudden, my... My entire world was turned upside down again, Mm -hmm. right? Because I realized that pretty much 
all of my family, close family, was against me. I had prayed. I got what was, to me, a clear answer to prayer. And everyone around me was saying, no, it is not. That is not an answer to your prayer. That's wrong. Don't do that. So is the rest of your family, are they Christians? Yeah. So they, yeah. they, so you told them the story that you were praying and God in this, in this book showed up two days after you prayed that. So they're just saying that's not how God works and God didn't do that. Yeah. I mean, uh, wow. yeah. <laughs> that's Basically. crazy. So, um, you know, the, that was a very difficult uh, time. I imagine. Week. The only person in my life that supported me um, was my mom. Because my mom had, it was always been into healthy stuff. So she had, a, she had stacks and stacks of books. By, she had every book written by Paul Bragg. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. Pavo Ariola, Jack LaLanne. She had the original copy of The Miracle of Rebound Exercise. Oh my gosh, that's funny. Which I have in my library now. Yeah. She had uh, Fasting Can Save Your Life by Herbert Shelton. Oh God, yeah. No one's heard of that guy. Yeah. Um, that's so, a good one. Yeah. Yeah, my mom had all this. Okay. And so she understood right away. She you know, understood right away when I said, oh, I got this book and this is what I'm thinking about doing. She said, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, so, but a lot of other family members, and, you know, my dad was kind of stoic, so he he wasn't against me, wasn't, you know, enthusiastic about what I wanted to do either. Uh, he just kind of let me make my own decisions. Okay. Yeah. But a lot of other family members, extended family members and in-laws and people who love me, right? They love me, but they just thought I was wrong. And they are, were very conventionally minded. And so I had all this pressure on me. And for my wife, too, who loves me. And we have, like, a fantastic relationship. We've been together now. We've been married now for uh, at least 16 years this wow. year. But but that was a very, really tense time because, you know, everybody thought I was going to die. And I thought if I, if I didn't do what the doctor said, I was going to die. So I reluctantly agreed to go see the oncologist just to appease family members, which is what a lot of cancer patients do. A lot of cancer patients don't want to do chemo. They don't want to do radiation. They don't want to do any of the treatments. They feel fine. They don't even feel sick when they're diagnosed. And but everybody around them saying, "Oh, you got to do it. You got to go to the doctor. You got to do chemo. You got to, you know, got to go the oncologist appointment." Mm -hmm. So I'm like, "Okay, I'll go see. You know, I'll go talk. Go see the. You know, I'll go see the oncologist. I'll go hear what he has to say." Uh-oh. Just to, like I said, <laughs> just to appease and just to relieve some of the pressure. Yeah. And that meeting did not go well. I mean, <laughs> a couple of funny things happened. I'm, we're in the waiting room, waiting to go back, and out comes Jack LaLanne on the TV. Oh, no way. And, yeah, it was one of the morning shows. It wasn't like a juicer commercial. It was like one of the morning shows. And he comes out and he starts going off about nutrition and the reason we're so sick is because we're eating all this man-made processed food and junk food and you got to get back to a diet of fruits and vegetables and oh juicing. Gosh. Yeah, and if man made it, don't eat it. Yeah, yeah, that's like, a big thing. I think this is on TV right now. In the hospital. You know? I mean, I was just in the clinic, in the cancer clinic, that's in the waiting crazy. room. That's crazy. That is so crazy. Yeah, it was that crazy. You saw that right as you're in the waiting room. That's so amazing. Yeah, I mean, it was like miraculous, you know, that it happened right when I was in the waiting room. And I just, I, I you know, I looked at my wife, I said, like, can you please put this on right now? And she was like, oh, that's pretty weird. Yeah. So <laughs> we go back and see the oncologist, and like I said, it didn't go well. I mean, the guy gave me, there's the standard pitch. Uh-huh. You're going to need 5-FU plus leucovorin chemo. Your odds of survival are, you got about 60% chance of living five years. Wow. Uh, which didn't inspire you know, much faith in treatment. Mm -hmm. And I asked him about the raw food diet and he said, no, you can't do that. It'll fight the chemo. Mm -hmm. Hello. And then, uh, then I said, well, are there any alternative therapies available? Mm -hmm. And at that point his demeanor changed dramatically and he became very arrogant and condescending. And he just said, no, if you don't do chemotherapy, you're insane. And then he said some more stuff but I don't know what he said because I kind of went into a tailspin. You know, as soon as he said that, my stress hormones start pumping, the fear, you know, the anxiety takes over, everything gets kind of blurry. Yeah. You know? 
like the deer in the headlights, right? Man. And he's just uh, intently trying to talk me into chemo, right? With all the reasons that he had. And, uh, and, and yeah, to be honest, I don't know what else he said except for this one sentence that kind of like cut through the fog, which was in the middle of whatever he was saying. He was like, and look, I'm not saying this because I need your business. Oh my gosh. Really? Yeah. 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 It came out as, as soon as he came out of his mouth, I was like, whoa, like what? Like, did he business? Like, what does business have to do with anything? Yeah. Right. Wow. And, uh, hmm. and then, you know, whatever more talking <laughs> on from him, not mm-hmm. so much for me. And then eventually we are, we finished our meeting and I basically just kind of like a robot, like went straight to the desk and made an appointment to, to get a port put in to start chemotherapy in a few weeks. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. So that's how powerful fear is. When you're afraid, you make irrational impulsive, emotional decisions. Mm -hmm. You cannot think clearly and rationally when you're afraid. And in cancer clinics all across the world, doctors are intimidating patients Mm -hmm. with fear. And they're telling them, if you don't do what I say, you're going to die in so many words, right? This is your only option. You have no other options. I'm your only hope. Mm -hmm. And so patients don't want to die. And so they'll agree to anything. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. One of the doctors that I, I was listening to a story once of this doctor who was, um, on the phone with, um, a patient and the patient was seeing a medical, uh, sorry, seeing a a naturopathic doctor and, uh, the patient put the doctor on speakerphone so that the naturopathic doctor who she was with at the time that, that the call came in, uh, so that the naturopathic doctor could hear the medical doctor talk. And the medical doctor says, here are your options. And I just thought, whoa. So in the entire universe, here are the, here's, here's all the options in the entire universe, or here are the only options that I know about. It was so telling. Absolutely. Well, and the truth is that, you know, an oncologist is only trained to do three things, you know, surgery, chemo, and radiation. Right. That's what they're trained to do. So the, you know, nutrition, natural therapies, non-toxic therapies, all the other stuff out there that, that is used in other countries mm-hmm. uh, is not used in the U.S. because the pharmaceutical industry has such a stranglehold mm-hmm. on medicine. And, uh, you know, they basically want to keep the status quo, which is making billions and billions of dollars off patented drugs. Mm-hmm. And that's why patented drugs are the main drugs used in cancer treatment. And uh, once a drug goes off patent or what we call off label, mm-hmm. they kind of fall by the wayside, even though they may be more effective or as effective as the new drugs, the new drugs are more profitable. And so that's what the pharmaceutical reps push to the doctors. So it's a really messed up, corrupt system. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, even the best doctors are tr- oncologists are trapped in a system that pays them really well to do what they do despite the results. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you live or die. They're going to get paid really well. Because they're sticking to (laughs) the standard of care, you know, and that's that's it. Yeah, they're going to stick to standard of care. And plus, you know, if they deviate from it, they risk being blackballed, ostracized, losing their license, being called a quack or a crank Mm -hmm. by, you know, other skeptical oncologists in the industry and being slandered. So there's a lot of pressure just to toe the line, Mm -hmm. right? Don't, you know, stay in your lane. Do not get out of step with everyone else. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, then you make everyone else look bad. So Mm -hmm. you better, you know, protect the, protect our interests. So So how long did it, so how long did it take for you to get your wife on board? Yeah. Good question. It took some time. Uh-huh. It took some time. You know, the toughest part was, as I was saying earlier about the oncology clinic, 
you know, I made this appointment to start chemo because even though Jack Lane was on the TV and, you know, the oncologist said some really weird stuff to me, yeah. the fear was more powerful, right? Wow. And, you know, I, I couldn't think clearly. But f- fortunately, I had several weeks, three weeks, before I was going to start chemo. Uh-huh. So I had time to get, you know, to get my wits about me, right? To, right. to clear my head and really think through my situation. And by the way, I'd been on a raw food diet for a week when I saw the oncologist. And so I you know, went home and I just kept doing it, raw food and juicing, just hardcore. I went 100% raw on the first day, you know, like immediately. There was no, wow. there was no like, no, mm, let me think about it. It yeah. was just instantaneous transition to this diet because I, I just thought, this makes a lot of sense to me. This is hardcore. I've never done anything like this before. Mm-hmm. And I want to see what happens to my body when I do this. Mm-hmm. So anyway, but, um, but I, I realized, you know, uh, during that time when I was kind of waiting to get the port put in, mm-hmm. I, it was kind of like I realized I had two paths before me. I had the, the widely, the wide, brightly lit, paved road that everyone was going down. Mm -hmm. And that was the road to the train station to get on the chemo train. Mm -hmm. And everybody was going down that road and there were people cheering you on and running races for you and Mm -hmm. everybody's so supportive, right? And then you get on the train and everybody's so nice and it's state of the art. Mm -hmm. Everything is beautiful and modern and the chairs are really comfortable (laughs) and they bring you little cookies and candies and snacks and off you go on the chemo train. Right, right. And the suffering starts immediately and there's no guarantee that you're going to be well at the end of the line. And once that train starts, it's real hard to get off. Uh And when they drop you off at the end, they may be dropping you off to die. Mm -hmm. So that was option number one. That was scary to me. Option number two was a path into the jungle that I had to hack my way through alone in the dark. Right? Right? The path that says do not enter, <laughs> right? Yeah. That is overgrown. And that was scary, too. And also, so no had, one supports you on that path, probably, you know, for most people. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You're alone. You realize, I realized I was alone. Mm-hmm. And I had two options. Both options were scary. And I wished there was another option that wasn't scary. But there wasn't. <laughs> I had two but I knew that the, the path into the jungle, man, alone, was the path that God had shown me. You know, I asked for something else, and he, he illuminated this path. And so I, I knew that I had to step out in faith and to trust him that he would lead me through, right? I mean, it was a deep exercise of faith and trust. And did you think at that time that uh, you were willing to do it even if your wife wasn't on board or you just figured she would become on board as soon as she started learning some stuff like you did? You know, it wasn't, it was more of the first, first thing. Uh It was more of, I have to do this for me. I have to do this to live. Wow. Right? Right. I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to live. And if I live, everything will be okay. Mm. Right? My critics won't matter mm-hmm. if I live. Right? And, uh, and I just can't worry about what they think about me right now, mm-hmm. even though that was really tough. It was really tough to have a lot of people think you're, you're being foolish and uh-huh. stubborn. Right? That's what people were telling me. I was wow. being stubborn. I can imagine. And, uh, but I just knew that's the way I had to go and I had to go alone wow. and that forced me to trust God in a way I never had before. And it's just kind of like, okay, God, I'm all alone. Like you better see me through this 
because otherwise I'm just going to die a fool. Yeah. Golly, that's what a, what a story. So it was tough, man. And so anyway, the, the appointment, you know, to get the port put in the day finally comes Mm -hmm. and I, you know, I got, I woke up that morning and I'm just like, no, not going, (laughs) no way. Yeah. And cause I was feeling really good, you know, I was feeling really good. Didn't go you know, the oncologist clinic. I mean, the, the cancer clinic, you know, they, they call and left messages and sent me a certified letter. I mean, they really after me to get, you know, to get my business. But, uh, but I, I just kind of stood my ground and I was like, no, I'm not doing it. You wow. know, maybe later, you know, things change to me. It was like, the way I thought about it is like, look, I can always go do chemo. That's a last resort. Yeah, right. But I really want to rebuild my body. Like I'm, I was excited about changing my whole life. I was excited about it. Wow. And I believed that it would have a profound impact in my health, in my instincts. I had very little go, to go on. I mean, the internet was not helpful back then, man. No. No, there was no extreme health radio show <laughs> in 2004. Okay. Right. There was like, very little resources. All I had were like my mom's books from the 1970s and 80s. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, and there's some good ones in there. I mean, she had a cancer battle plan. She had the cure for all cancers. She had uh, stuff by Dr. Richard Schultz. She had some stuff from Lorraine Day. Cancer oh, yeah. doesn't scare me anymore. Mm-hmm. So my mom had some really great resources and that, that was huge. That's so great that you had that influence from your mom. That's awesome. It's a miracle, dude. Think yeah. about it. That my mom had saved and stored all those books for me. Right? Wow. She never needed any of them. She never had cancer. She was never sick. No health problems. She had just become really. My mom is just is a has been a is a lifelong learner. Yeah. Avid reader. She just devours books. She mm-hmm. always has. And all all types, not just health books, but she's devoured like. Who knows, man, hundreds and hundreds of health and personal, personal development books and, wow. you know, and fiction and all kinds of stuff. And man, an she influence. just had all these books, man, set aside. And then when, when I needed them, there they were. And, uh, and I didn't even, I mean, there's no way I could even go through them all. I mean, she, there's still books that, she, you know, I hadn't read that she had in her library. So, but anyway, the point was that, you know, every book I went to during that time, right in the beginning, they were all pointing back to the same thing. They were all confirmatory. Mm-hmm. They were all pointing back to raw food. They were all pointing to juicing. They were all pointing to your attitude and your emotions and forgiveness mm-hmm. and, um, and stress, you know, which of course is forgiveness and your emotions are all wrapped up in stress. So, uh, so yeah, I kept getting the same messages from, you know, different books and, so in a lot of ways that helped me. Um, it, it helped me. It kept it simple, even though I had no support groups, no cancer healing buddies. There was no Facebook, no YouTube, no Twitter, no social media. Mm-hmm. Right? I wasn't a part of any um, online, you know, support groups or even local support groups. I went to a raw food support group uh, or like you know whatever. It was just weird. The people in it were weird I and know, not right? friendly at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't raw foodism wasn't like cool and hip and like, like a bunch of hot young 20 somethings, you know, it was like mostly people older than me. because I was 26. I was the only young guy. It was a bunch of older people, uh, who weren't even friendly. And it was, you know, so I went to that twice and I was like, okay, well, I don't really, this isn't really doing it for me. Right. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah. So I was just alone, man. And, but here's the thing over time, things changed. Time changes things. And as I got, you know, I had, I found a, a local naturopathic uh, nutritionist, <clears throat> like one of the only ones in Memphis. Uh-huh. Um, and then he knew of a sort of under underground integrative oncologist. Oh, wow. A guy named Dr. Roy Page, who is now deceased. But he'd come out of retirement in his 70s because he didn't like being retired. And he had been, been an oncologist his whole life, and he had gotten interested in integrative alternative therapies because he knew that the conventional treatments, chemo, didn't work. He knew how brutal they were. He knew how ineffective they were. And he was, like, reading and researching and trying, you know, non-toxic therapies like vitamin C IVs. Mm-hmm. 
uh, on his patients, like giving them, you know, giving them some alternatives. And he was really interested in, in trying to help people get well. And so, yeah, so I did vitamin C IV therapy with him. And he had my blood work drawn every month and ordered some CT scans every about every six months for the first couple of years. So we were keeping very close eye on everything. Wow, what a blessing and, to found uh, that guy. Oh, it was, I mean, everything that happened was, was just God. Yeah. It was it, I just from one thing to the next to the next. And that's, that's how I, you know, that's how I kept going. Because, you know, he just, just when I needed it, I would get a sign. You know what I mean? Mm. Just when I was feeling lost. It would yeah. be another little signpost in the, you know, on the jungle path to remind me that I was going the right way. That's so cool. And, and so, sometimes all it takes is just a little bit of, just a little sign, you know, just something small, you know? Just, yeah, just a little spark yeah. to reignite your faith. Mm-hmm. And, and I had a lot of those little sparks along the way. That's and, awesome. Uh, it, man, you know, it, I mean, just looking back, it was... Um, I mean, yeah, it was really miraculous, but I don't want to say it was miraculous in the sense that it, that I'm special and then that you know no one else could have. It. I mean, the truth is, is that when you when you really listen to God and you when you trust God and you you step out in faith, He does the same thing for you that He does for me. Like He gives you those signs and He brings people into your life and information into your life. Like He He orchestrates, you know. Your, your path, it says in Proverbs that a man makes plans, but the Lord directs his steps, mm-hmm. you know? And so, yeah, I mean, you know, God's involved in our lives, and he's directing our steps, and a lot of times we don't even know it, we don't even acknowledge him or give him credit for it. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I do, big mm-hmm. time. And so, you know, fast forward, uh, six years, six and a half years after my diagnosis, like, I'm in the best shape of my life, alive and kicking, and everything's great, and I'm like, well... You know, people start asking me like, "What did you do?" You know, like, I, I, you didn't do chemo. Like, are you? How's your health? You still have cancer? I'm like, no, man, I don't have cancer. Like, I'm great. I'm like super healthy. You know. Wow. And uh, and so I, I decided to start the Chris Beat Cancer Blog. That was 2010. Wow. And um, just to share my story, like I didn't think you know, it wasn't to make money or like to become popular. I just like, well, if I put my story out there. I know there are people who are desperate for a testimonial mm-hmm. because I was like, I was just desperate. Is there anybody else out there who has healed cancer? Like anywhere? Can I find that? You know, I mean, like I just really need that encouragement bad yeah. and it was hard to find it in 2004. So I just thought, man, I, I you know, I, let me just put my story out there and I know it'll encourage some people. And cause you know, you know, I was, that's what I wanted. That's what I needed. And, you know, I just discovered a, lo- a love for, for writing and researching, and I, you know, I was already pretty, you know, sort of like a, a uh, obsessive nerd by that point. It's been six years, and so I learned a lot. So I mean, I felt like, man, I've got a lot to share. Like I've learned a lot in the last six years, and all my friends and people I know have just been drinking, you know, beer and eating barbecue. <laughs> like I've been like down the rabbit hole. And, uh, and I'm come, I've come back up with a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah, right. So I started, started blogging about, you know, nutrition and health and cancer and the cancer industry and all kinds of stuff. And um, just things that I thought were important, that were important to me. And little did I know when I started that there were so many other people looking for this. I mean, I figured there were a few, but there was a lot. And, you know, Google was very kind to me because... You know, I guess because there weren't really any other alternative cancer bloggers. I mean, Chris Carr, mm-hmm. um, that was about it. And so a lot of people found me quickly, and um, my audience grew, and I just started making videos. And then I started finding a lot of other survivors who had healed with nutrition and natural therapies. And every time I found one, I'd be like, hey, you know, hey, can I interview you? Like, your story's awesome. Your story's better than mine. Yeah. I want to share it. So it turned into to that, and you understand this, because, hey, you're interviewing me. It's the same deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've interviewed a lot of people who have healed all, all types and all stages of cancer, uh, you know, some with no conventional therapy whatsoever. Some have done it after surgery, chemo, and radiation, failed them. Mm-hmm. And, um, like, I get just as excited today when I meet someone uh, as I did, you know, when I first started the blog six years ago. Wow. So, 
yeah, man, it's just grown to to be a really incredible thing. And for the first five years of the blog, it was just my part time passion, and I was still working in real estate. Uh-huh. And it finally grew, kind of turned a corner after about five years, where you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm getting, it's getting a million visitors a year on the site. It's like, whoa, wow, like, this is crazy. And you know, when your site gets a million visitors a year, like it, it just makes money. It's like it's like almost impossible for it to not make money. And so it, eventually, it was like, wow, this is great. Like I can actually. Uh, make a living, like provide for my family doing what I love to do, like pursuing my passion. Isn't that amazing? And uh, so I was able to to stop become, being, an, you know, an active real estate professional and just focus full time on writing and speaking and making videos and, and podcasting and everything that I do, that, you know, sort of the Chris Beat cancer um, life <laughs> entails, yeah. uh, doing interviews with you or whatever. Well, um, and, you know, I'm just super blessed, man. It's so awesome because, like, you know, it's sort of, it's shocking and unfortunate that there's such a need and demand for your work, you know, because theoretically, if chemo and radiation worked so well, you know, it would be great if if you didn't have any people reading because chemo and and radiation would work well. But, man, it's amazing that there's so many people out there. Um, But it makes sense because... So many people are so terrified of doing it, um, but it's just so it's so great because you can't hide information anymore like you could have in the mid '90s, even or even in the early 2000s. You can't you can't hide. You know, when you do an interview, I saw just recently you had Dr. Keneally on, and she was on our show recently. And yeah. when you talk to people like that, and they're having success stories, you can't and you put that up on YouTube. You you can't hide information anymore, and so. Now people that are freshly getting diagnosed are finding your website, and what a change! I mean, you, your site is actively changing the course of other people's lives, and I think about this all the time. Someone finds out about you, and and because of the things that they find out about you, their life changes, and maybe they live a heck of a lot longer. Maybe they have kids. Those kids would have never been in the world if it weren't for you. It's like that ripple effect, you know. It's crazy, man. I know. I can't even, like, it baffles the mind when you, I mean, just, just knowing that you've maybe helped one person, yeah. you know, live longer or heal completely mm-hmm. is just so, you know, humbling, really. I mean, it's just like, gives you so much joy and satisfaction knowing that. And I mean, yeah, now, like I said, I mean, last year my site got over 2 million visitors. It's like crazy. I don't even... I can't even comprehend what what the impact is out there in the world, but yeah. um, based on all the on all the messages I get, it's pretty positive. Yeah. So, um, but you know, you made a really interesting point. Is yeah, the reason my site and and me or I have become uh, you know, whatever is really because of the dismal failure of conventional oncology, mm-hmm. right? It's not because of me. It's because of them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I was kind of right place, right time guy. Like, I um, decided to share my story in 2010 when blogging was still kind of newish. But uh, I was, well, you know, kind of one of the first people out of the gate and talking about alternative cancer therapies. And but, but the point is, I mean, it was all the people looking Right? There was already all this pent-up demand because all these people, thousands of people, have watched their loved ones suffer and die through cancer treatment. Mm-hmm. Right, And they're diagnosed. They're like, no way. Like, there's no way I'm doing what my mom or my sister and my dad and my brother did. Mm-hmm. You know, No way I'm doing that. What else is out there, Google? Right, right. And, then, and you've got the other segment of, patients that they do conventional therapy at least one round and it fails right and then they're like no way i'm letting them do any you know treat me again because it didn't work the first time Mm -hmm. and now they want to use even more aggressive drugs Mm -hmm. right plan a failed i've got a lot less faith in plan b what else is out there google like oh chris who's this chris guy so yeah yeah man it's crazy but you know it's we're in the information age and unfortunately there's been a as amazing as it is with all the testimonials on YouTube and everywhere, people healing and interviews with, 
nat- you know, uh, cancer healing experts and survivors and all the good stuff that's happening. Uh-huh. We also have a, a new problem, which is information overload. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, even if my site was the only one on the Internet, there's hundreds of articles and interviews just on my site. It's too <laughs> much. You know, I, and I don't want to take any of it down. It's, I mean, I actually have taken down a few things here and there that I felt like, you know what, it's now very much value. Yeah. But for the most part, I'm like, this is all so good, you know. I don't want to take any of it down. And so now, um, you know, uh, and it, this has going for, been going on for years, but I get messages almost every day from people saying, like, you know, I have cancer, help. What do I, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Like, what, you know, and there's not a short answer to that question, Right. Like, Chris, I have cancer. What should I do? I mean, how many, how much time do you have? Like, you know, can you come spend a week with me? Mm-hmm. That's not possible. So <clears throat> I took I basically like this. You mentioned this in the beginning of the interview. And so what, what's I'm really excited about, excited about this, what's about to happen on February 15th is that we are, uh, I'm, you know, unveiling the square one, healing cancer coaching program. Yeah. Which tell is, me about that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically, it's a 10 module course. It's 10 one hour video modules that take a patient from knowing zero, right? All the way to, I mean, basically I called it square one because it's like, this is where you need to start. I'm going to show you exactly where to start and mm-hmm. what to do. Like I'm going to, there's two models on the anti-cancer diet. There's a module on your attitude and your emotions and the cancer industry. Like, you know, not the industry, but like understanding cancer. There's a module on stress. There's a module on exercise and rest. Module on um, spiritual healing. And there's a module on uh, supplementation. And there's a module on testing and how to monitor your progress. So it's a, it's a really comprehensive course that is also very simple and straightforward. So there's a lot of information but it's not information overload mm-hmm. and it's all cohesive. So it's not like here's a thousand, you know, anti-cancer therapies, A to Z, right? Like it's, it's not that. Right. Right. <laughs> Cause that all that's going to do is make somebody confused and overwhelmed and they don't even still don't know where to start. So what this course does is it just, again, it just walks through every change they need to make in their life. Like if they're serious about healing. So it's diet, lifestyle, emotion, stress, and then, of course, like practical stuff like supplementation and exercise and things. So um, I'm super excited about it. I mean, it's been a long time coming. You know, 13 years of my own experience and research, coaching hundreds of cancer patients one-on-one, and, of course, interacting and interviewing lots of cancer experts and doctors and all kinds of people, researchers. So That's awesome. that uh, course is going to be free online starting February 15th. So the entire thing. All 10 modules will air for 10 days, free online. And uh, so, yeah, man, it's it's a really, really big, exciting project. And it's, wow. we're you know, two weeks away from this thing. By the time your listeners hear it, it might be, you know, two days away. I don't know when this show is going to air, but yeah. but uh, you can link to it in the show notes or whatever. But, um, yeah. That's it's, awesome. Uh, it is. A, it's like, you know, something that's been a long time coming, and I'm just really excited it's finally finished and about to impact the world. And I think you know, we've got a lot of um, people that are really excited about it and promoting it, like the truth about cancer and mm-hmm. the food revolution and um, green med info mm-hmm. and cancer tutors. So there's a lot of really awesome That's organizations great. and people that have gotten behind me and are, and, and are like, like let's, let's push this out to the world. That's so great because, you know, that's the number one, as you know, I mean, that's the number one thing people have an issue with is, is going from zero to a thousand overnight, like that when they first get that diagnosis, you know, their learning curve is just so intense because they've never even heard really maybe of, you know, vitamin B17 or, you know, um, just any number of different things, you know, people just don't know about them because they're not in our current, you know, cultural vernacular. They're not in our culture, our society. People don't Mm -hmm. know about this stuff. So taking someone by the hand and doing, you know, step one, step two, step three, I think would be super valuable. You know, I've, I've had, I rolled it out in a very small kind of a soft, 
you know, it's like a soft opening way last summer and mm-hmm. had a thousand people go through the course and the feedback was just off the charts. I mean, they, we, I just knew, I mean, it's just like, whoa, like, wow, this is exactly what people need. And like you said, you're right. There is a steep learning curve, right? There's a steep learning curve when you're, when you're talking about changing your whole life mm-hmm. and there's a re-education process that happens because you got to have to kind of toss everything out that you thought you knew about health. Right, mm-hmm. you've been told your all your whole life, you know, like eating meat and dairy is healthy, and right. um, so and you know everything in moderation, kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, having said that, you know, even though there's a steep learning curve, I think the problem that people have is they just don't even know where to start learning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's a steep learning curve. But if there was only one book, and then you just dive into that one book and you start learning it but there's thousands there's, a, there's books and websites like it's just like everywhere and so that's what people are really getting bogged down and discouraged and overwhelmed and they just they're just like i don't know what to do i just i'm just gonna go do chemo yeah right uh-huh. and so you know the goal of square one is to say hey like you do this and i'm just gonna walk you through like i'm just gonna teach you not everything i know but everything that i uh, have taken and learned from my own experience and people who build successfully, right? Mm-hmm. I'm giving you the most important things, which, well, again, square one, I'm giving you the starting point to change your whole life and start your healing adventure. And where you take it from there is up to you. But, uh, and so for some people, it's all they'll need, you know, and others will, 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 it'll get them going and then they'll maybe discover some other things and try some other new things or whatever. Um, but it's, you know, just getting people from zero to one, you know, like, as like the Peter Thiel book Mm -hmm. is huge. Yeah. That's the biggest obstacle is going from zero to one. Um, so is this going to them enough confidence, right? Enough hope. And I talk, you know, the course talks about this or I talked about it in the trailer. It's like giving them the hope and the clarity and the confidence to take action Mm -hmm. and change their life. You know, that's the goal. Like, once people take action and get that ball rolling, then all of a sudden it's just easier and easier to make those changes, right? The most difficult yeah. part is just, just just taking that first step. So we're just trying to make it as easy as possible for people to and, and help them understand, like, you, don't, you have so much influence on the course of your life and on your odds of recurrence and on odds of survival, like, the choices you make every day can make all the difference, whether you're doing chemo or not. It's mm-hmm. an anti-chemo, of course. Like, I'm not, you know, I have strong feelings about the cancer industry, but I really don't do any cancer industry or chemo bashing in the course. Like, it's not about trying to make people feel bad about having done chemo or radiation or whatever. Like, right. you know, this is applicable to every cancer patient. It doesn't matter if they're doing chemo now or if they've said, I'll never do chemo. Mm-hmm. Like, these are the universal foundational principles of health and healing. Mm-hmm. Like they, they just plug right into whatever you're doing. So we get a lot of emails that come in. People, um, so many people write and say they have cancer or they were just diagnosed or their friend or family was diagnosed recently. Um, is this something I could point people to on an ongoing basis or is it going to go away at some point? You know, it won't go away. Okay. Um, square one will, will continue on in perpetuity. Um, but we're doing a very special thing. I mean, it's, it's a paid program, but we're doing this really special thing where in days the entire course is going to be free of mine. So, um, you know, it's just a way to kind of give back and say, hey, like, here it is. Like, anybody that wants it that can't afford it, and it's an inexpensive anyway, but anybody that wants it and, and just can't afford it or you just want to watch it for free and go through it for free, like, here you go. Okay, nice. So there's like... um a time where it's going to be available for free, but then after that, people can pay for it at any time. Absolutely. Okay, that's cool. And yeah. is there a place like um, can, inside, is there a place for people to develop community or talk with you, or how does that work on the inside? Yeah, yeah, people that... Um, <clears throat> so uh, anyone that uh, decides to buy the course to own after the, the free viewing um, gets access to live Q&A calls with me. And, you know, one in the course. So I do these live Q&A calls every month. We have a private Facebook support group just for people in Square One. Oh, cool. So, yeah, there's there's a 
support built in uh, to the to the course for people that are like really serious about it. So oh, that's so cool. Gosh, that's so cool, man. I'm so glad you're doing this. You know, I mean, thank you. Yeah, me I, too. <laughs> I, I, re- I really am because uh, for people that follow us on Instagram, um, you know, my mom went into uh, to the city of Hope and. Uh, she went there a few weeks, I don't know, probably a few months ago now, but they found a spot on her lung, and so they wanted to go in, and she wanted to go have it looked at and all this stuff, and just walking around that hospital, the City of Hope, and, you know, I'm at the City of Hope, and I didn't see hope. I didn't. I really didn't. Yeah. It was so, I just felt so bad, and I was just praying for these people that God would open their eyes, and gosh, I just felt such a burden for them, and... You know, we took the stairs from one level to the next level down on the ground. And in the stairwell, it talks about like vitamin C and cancer and it talks about blueberries and antioxidants and cancer. But when you, you know what I mean? And my wife and I were just looking at each other, just completely blown away that they were putting this. But then we realized, oh, it's in the stairwell and no one's going to go in the stairwell, you know? Nobody takes the stairs. (laughs) But yeah, I just felt we're all so sedentary. Everyone's so sedentary; they're too lazy to take the stairs. Yeah, and so I figured the yeah. amount of people that are going to see that are so slim. I just felt so, you know, it's it's one thing to be in our world where we're surrounded by healthy people, vibrant, and all this stuff. But when you get back into that world, gosh, the burden becomes so strong, you know. Yeah, it's it's very it's a very heavy burden, and hospitals are not a place of hope. They're a, they they love to use the word hope, mm-hmm. right? They love to use that word. But what it, they really are is a fear factory, mm-hmm. you know? It's just fear, anxiety, despair, hopelessness. That's that's really what's happening, mm-hmm. you know? Um, they use hope in their advertising and marketing campaigns. Um, and, you know, it's a very different kind of hope. When I talk about hope, I'm talking about giving people hope that they can heal, Right that they can change their life, that they have the power to influence their future, Mm -hmm. right? That is hope. That's what hope is. Mm -hmm. And when people go into conventional cancer treatment, they're putting all of their hope in a doctor in treatments, right? They're putting their hope in a doctor and treatments that are very unlikely to cure them Mm -hmm. statistically, right? Right. But they're hoping that they will be in the lucky few that end up cured, mm-hmm, right? Like Long term, right? And that's that's not really hope. You know what I'm saying? It's more like they think it's hope, and they use the word hope, but it's really more like false hope, like wishful thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like you know gambling. Really, mm-hmm, I mean, yeah. look, the odds are, are really slim mm-hmm. uh, with a lot of solid tumor cancers that especially if you're stage two, three, or four, that treatments are going to cure you, mm-hmm. they, you know? So um, that's the sad thing is that, you know, they're, they're not getting, um, you know, they're, they're putting hope, they're putting their hope in something that is really unlikely to work, mm-hmm. right? So it's a whole different ball game when you, when you see someone light up and they, they have that epiphany, that light bulb moment when they realize, like, they have power, right, to change their life and to influence their future. And when they realize, wow, yeah, I, I have not been living in a way that promotes health, right? Mm-hmm. It's not about blame or shame or beating people up. It's just like, hey, you know, your choices have consequences. And, you know, if you look at your life and look at all of your choices, well, your situation today is the result of all the choices you've made up until this point, mm-hmm. right? Like, Everything happens for a reason, and most of the time, the reason is you. (laughs) You're the reason. (laughs) So, uh, you know, now that we know that, we let's start making different decisions. Like, let's change the way we live and see what happens. So, I think when people catch a hold of that, man, you know, they change. Like, they they get this real this this enthusiasm and excitement and what I call real hope that's powerful and palpable. Mm. And man, that's just what, that's what drives me. That's what keeps me going is seeing that, you know, seeing that in people. And of course, testimonials and feedback. I had a guy, you know, just last week, a guy made this 
what I would call substantial donation to my site. Wow. And, uh, I mean, I don't want people to think he gave me a million dollars, but, you know, he just gave me a larger than average donation. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and, uh, and, and he sent a message with it and he said, Hey man, I don't, you know, I don't know if you remember me. We met three years ago and I had stage three colon cancer and, you know, basically I'm alive today because of you. Wow. And it's like, whoa, man. How old a guy you is know? he? Uh, I don't remember. I want to say 30s or 40s. Okay. You know, yeah, he was either 30s or 40s. And I actually uh, I recognized his name instantly because we communicated a few times. Wow. Um, but we met at a conference in, uh, on the West Coast, California, a few years ago. And I think we might have even had lunch at a conference. You know, just he just came out to me and said, you want to have lunch? And I was like, yeah, man, have lunch. Wow. Let's talk. And, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, stuff like that, when you get you messages know? like that, yeah. yeah, when you get messages like that, it's like, man, I'm doing the right thing, Yeah, you know, and, and it doesn't matter how many people try to attack me or discredit me or whatever, which by the way, isn't many, mm-hmm. um, but there are all, there will always be haters Oh yeah, uh, and skeptics and, you know, just unhappy people that don't, you know, just want to argue or whatever. Um, but messages like that, I mean, it just just sort of just crushes any uh, <laughs> any like naysayers. Right. You know? Wow. So. What an awesome thing you're doing, man. I'm so, so, so happy to support you and uh, just love watching you and your site grow and influence and grow in terms of how many people you're helping. Um, you know, you're changing the world. You know, you really are. And uh, people exist. I, I would imagine people are either exist now or are going to exist that wouldn't have existed if it weren't for you, you know? You're getting a little too deep and heavy for me, man. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So I'm just, I'm just a big... A dude. I'm just a dude and a computer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just awesome. Doing my thing. Yeah, I love, I love watching helpful, you know? Yeah. Thank you. No, man. Hey, and you're doing, you're doing a great work yourself. You know, we're both on the same team, just trying to spread, spread the message of health and healing. And, you know, um, yeah. we're all in this together, just trying to encourage people and open their eyes and give them resources and options. And, you know, I, and I'm just thankful to, to be able to share my story and my, uh, my crazy philosophies on your show. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. I know you're just going crazy right now with your schedule. Um, but thanks for being on, man. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. So it's uh crispycancer.com, correct? crispycancer.com and uh, yeah I'll send you if you want to put links to the the 20 questions guide we talked about and uh, and the square one program um, you can put them in your show notes or whatever yeah yeah sure thing hang on the line there really quick uh, Chris I'm just gonna close out the show uh, thanks everyone for joining us and I really really appreciate it so much um, and your emails that come in and let us know what you guys are up to man what a amazing thing if you know of anyone who might benefit from this conversation that we had, uh, please send this show to them. Chris would appreciate it. I would appreciate it. Um, but most importantly, if you know someone who would benefit from this information, that's really what we're about is just helping as many people as we possibly can. So yeah, feel free to sh- uh, send this show to anyone you think might benefit. We would appreciate that. Um, and I'll be back at the end for a wrap up, but uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for listening. Thanks for everything that you do for us. Uh, we love you. and We'll catch you guys on the next episode. Hi, my name's John Kunkel. I'm 63 years of age. I watched several YouTube videos of Stephen Hewers and learned what supplements might help me with energy and weight loss. I've now been on the Andreas Black Cumin Seed Oil, Synergy One, and six other products from Synergistic Nutrition for several weeks now. I've lost 10 pounds. My joint pain has been reduced significantly. I have a lot of energy that I've never had before. My cravings for sweets are gone, and I'm rarely hungry. Even my cravings for foods like hamburgers and heavy carbohydrate meals are now gone is the only thing that's worked for me. I was seriously considering bariatric surgery, but that's out the window now. Thank you so much, Synergistic Nutrition. With Synergistic Nutrition, we help you take the guesswork out of supplementation and help you hit the bullseye of success. I encourage you to get specific about your health needs because when you do, your body will celebrate with energy and well-being. Click on the Synergy One banner ad right here at ExtremeHealthRadio.com. That's ExtremeHealthRadio.com. Well, there you go, Mr. Chris Wark. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. Um, 
Yeah, we had to do that one on the phone because I was having some real computer issues and I couldn't uh, I couldn't get my Skype to work correctly. So um, we had to do that one over the phone. Hopefully it sounded all right. Hopefully the audio was good. Um, it wasn't too too difficult to listen to. But um, yeah, very interesting guy. I like Chris a lot. Um, we chatted for gosh probably a half hour after the uh, the show off the air, and he was just sharing with me uh, his journey <clears throat> a little bit more and you know, the things that have changed in his life. And, um, I just, you know, I, uh, it's just, I see these people being diagnosed with cancer and, uh, you know, it seems like every single day you get news of someone, uh, being diagnosed with cancer, you know, whether they be prominent people or, or just friends and family, you know, it's like, man, it's so, it's so sad. I just, I have such a heart for it. I don't know what it is. I just feel like maybe in a past life or maybe God's given me some sort of compassion or sympathy or some or empathy or something extra and unique. Um, you know, like just today I woke up this morning and got news. I don't know if you're familiar with John Anthony West, uh, but he is a famed Egyptologist, um, self-taught, and he put out some incredible DVDs uh, called Magical Egypt, and they're awesome. Like there's, and he's been researching Egypt and uh, the mainstream media concerning Egypt, and and um, you know has his ideas and theories and philosophies about what was really going on in Egypt, and he's just been studying this for you know fifty, sixty years, and um, I think he's maybe in his late seventies now. But he was just diagnosed with cancer, and the cool thing that I saw was <clears throat> that he got accepted to you know being an unconventional guy. Uh, and being someone who doesn't really go with the mainstream, you know, thoughts on things, uh, as a result of, you know, his probably his research in in the area of uh, ancient Egypt, uh, he got accepted to the uh, uh, Brzezinski Institute. Uh, if you guys know anything about the Brzezinski Institute, that is a, a place where Dr. Uh, Stanis, Stanislav Brzezinski uses. Let me see if I can cor- if I can pronounce this correctly. It's called. Um, it's called. Neo, oh gosh, blast, not neoblastoma. I forget what it's called, but he's using some really interesting, um, natural modalities for healing cancer, uh, particularly in the brain. Um, and I'm not sure if that's what John Anthony West has, but, you know, it was awesome that he got accepted there and he's doing something unconventional. But that's the thing. It's like everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, but so many people are being diagnosed and it's just, I don't know. I don't, I don't like it. And, um, I suspect my theory about all this is that I think that people are being diagnosed with cancer more and more these days because cancer is essentially, um, a fungus. Uh, you know, a lot of people debate that, but there's a lot of people proponents that say that, but it makes a lot of sense. A cancer is a, is a tumor that's, um, <clears throat> that's eating you away, uh, much in the same way that, you know, candida or yeast or fungus does. And what, I think is going on is that we are being, our, our lifestyles are so, are so disconnected, not just from God and from source, but also from the earth. And so, you know, just the other day I was talking with my mom and I was saying, Hey mom, have you been, um, you know, cause, cause you know, many of you know that recently, I think I shared this on the show. Uh, she had an, uh, a spot show up on her, on her lung. And she got really nervous and, you know, afraid and, you know, who am I to judge someone else's emotions, right? Um, And so she wanted to go to the City of Hope and have a a, a procedure, bronchioscopy, I think it's called, uh, to go almost kind of do a biopsy of what that spot was, right? Because she had had her lung, man, she's been through the ringer. I think I mentioned this on the show, or many of you guys know this, but in 95, she was diagnosed with the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma given less than a 10% chance of, of survival. And it turns out that I was the only one who was a, uh, a blood match for a donor for her and for her to do a bone marrow transplant. So uh, this is before obviously I knew anything about health, but this is the thing that's so weird is that, you know, you can't necessarily have a dogmatic approach, right? Because she was diagnosed in 95 and I don't donated platelets. Um, I drove up to the city of hope, Gosh, I don't know how many days or weeks in a row to sit there for hours donating uh, platelets. 
And uh, so we did that, and she was in that quarantine bubble, and she had multiple stints of over a month long in the City of Hope Hospital. And uh, what happened was she had a chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and bone marrow transplant, and the whole nine yards. And, you know, she's still alive, you know? And I understand that. And if, if anyone should be hailing and waving the flag against um, conventional treatments, it should be me, right? Being in the alternative health field. But what do you say to that, right? Um, so I, I don't judge anybody's journey. Everyone has their own journey and everyone has their own um, path through this life. And it's important, whatever it is, to be in tune with whatever that path is. So, you know, if your path is to do conventional treatment, <clears throat> you know, who am I to know? I don't even know what kind of food is the best food. How do we even know what kind of food or diet is is reacting with our cells of our body at any given time? <clears throat> I mean, diet and nutrition is so complex and it's so easy on one level, but it's so complex on another. And so <clears throat> nobody really knows what's happening inside our body with just the food that we eat, let alone these treatments. And so I'm in no way advocating conventional treatment, but all I can say is that isn't it interesting that my mom got conventional cancer treatment? And I hate to see it because that's what really woke me up, sort of like what Chris had going on. Uh, he had that Jack LaLanne thing happen in the waiting room, and then he had the book that was given to him two days after he prayed, and God delivered a book to him. I mean, that's just weird, right? It's either weird or divine intervention in some capacity, you know. Um, and so <clears throat> I just find it very, very interesting. And the cool thing, what I liked about Chris is that he said, you know, he was very intuitive and in touch with his, uh, you know, his moral compass or his ability to make decisions. And he was very strong in that. And he was very much, um, someone who had conviction about these things. And I think that's what's, you know, one of the most important things because in our society, as, as you guys know, I mean, you listen to the news, you listen to all this stuff going on. There's so much conflicting information, right? Uh, not just an overabundance of information, but conflicting information. And that's one of the things too uh, that is used to produce what I would call sheep in our culture. People that blindly follow the path of others and blindly follow the path of perceived authority figures. So if you keep people with an overabundance of information <clears throat> and conflicting information, they become confused. And as always, fear is the number one way to get people to, um, to buy into whatever it is you're trying to buy, you know, get them to buy into. <clears throat> it's always fear. Fear is always the number one tool, number one best mechanism that anyone could ever use to manipulate um, somebody else for their benefit. Um, and the only way you can do that is if someone is confused or has an overabundance of information. Sometimes you don't even need confusing information. Sometimes you just need too much information, and that, it be, you know, that becomes overwhelming, right? Sometimes if you're just exposed to too much stuff, it's like, wow, I don't even know how to, it's too much information. I don't know, what, you know how to deal with this. Um, but then you throw on top of that conflicting information. And then so what happens is that people become confused. And if they become confused and um, unaware, they'll revert back to their old programming. And their old programming is what they were exposed to um, growing up and exposed to all throughout their lives through through commercials and through media, advertisements, um, through songs and magazines and all that stuff, TV so they'll always go back to that, just like Chris did. Like he was saying, it was hypnotic almost when he was in the hospital room um, or in the doctor's office talking with the doctor and asking about alternative therapies. And like he said, he had been doing raw food. He'd been probably halfway through that book being blown away by everything he was learning. And not only that, taking action and having done a raw vegan diet overnight for a week already and still signed up to go get his catheter put in. So this programming is hypnotic. It's a spell that we're all under, and it's um, it's up to us. It's part of our journey to disentangle ourselves from the the web that has you know been weaved all around us, holding us and holding our our convictions in. So 
when someone like Chris is very much in tune with his uh, moral compass, his character, his uh, intuition, you know, it becomes a powerful force because when you believe something and you know that you have to do it, no one can stop you. It doesn't matter what that is, you know, getting, you know, chemotherapy versus doing, you know, the Gerson diet. It could be starting a business. It could be, you know, going and hanging out with this person tonight or tomorrow night, or it could be, you know, choosing to participate in some event or some action that you know is not right. Um, you know, if you have a strong moral compass of who you are and what, what you're here for, it doesn't matter what fear tactics people can put on you. It doesn't matter what sorts of psychological manipulation or sub, you know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, subliminal programming or anything like that. It doesn't matter what they put on you because you, you know who you are and you know why you're here and what you're doing and what your whole, the whole course of your life is. So it doesn't matter. So at this point, I think it's so important for us to, to focus on those things, to focus on building our character, building our intuition, understanding and listening to our body, knowing who we are, understanding what our role is here and what our gifts and talents are. And when you're in tune with all that, no doctor is going to be able to tell you anything that you aren't going to, you know, have a feeling about and a really gut intuition about and be able to make your own decision. And that's really what my, goal here is of this site is to, and these interviews and these podcasts, um, is is to get people to rely on their own intuition and their own journey through life. Um, trust in God, trust in yourself, you know, and, and start becoming someone who does that. I think that's so, so important, man. It's so important because I just see so many people that are just, it's like they're, they're tossed to and fro, like it says in the Bible, you know, um, or their house is built of, on a foundation of sand. So as soon as the rain comes and the rain could be a diagnosis or rain could be um, anything, anything that comes up that's out of your consciousness that sort of hits you and you know, like blindsides you um, when the rains and storm come. If you don't have a firm understanding of who you are and why you're here then you're going to be tossed to and fro. The foundation of everything that you have, that that you think is the strong foundation of your life is going to be washed away. So you don't want that foundation to be built out of sand. So it's really, really important to understand and have strong moral convictions about who you are, why you're here, what you're doing, and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I thought was so cool about Chris, you know? Um, And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not judging anybody's journey. Uh, you know, I know people right now that are going through conventional treatment. I know people right now that are going through alternative treatment. I know people right now that are going through a hybrid approach. Um, you know, I just, my thoughts and prayers are with them to guide them and to strengthen them, you know, and so it's, uh, everyone has their own journey and whatever decision or path that they take, uh, is ultimately up to them and it's our job to support them. Because once you start getting into the the role of trying to be a facilitator of helping everybody, that becomes the weakest position for you. Um, you know, when you're trying to help people and change people and get them to think like you do, that becomes a weakened position because it's it's a it's a losing battle. You're you're never going to win that battle. Uh, so there's no use even trying. You know, um, so the best we can do is let people know what we are about and the information we know, we could just offer that up. And maybe if you're outspoken about these things, you know, they'll know about that before. But, um, you know, if, if they know what you're about, they'll come seek you and they'll come ask you for advice and for insight and for answers and for some, some ability to make, make sense of everything. And so, um, but if they, if you're not very outspoken and people don't know that you're into all this alternative weird medicine and natural cures and things like that, then, um, you know, maybe you could offer it up and say, Hey, I've got some resources. If you ever want, let me know. And I could send, send you some stuff or something. Um, and then it's up to us to simply support people on their journeys. Cause man, you know, listening to Chris's story and the amount of, it's just, man, it's so, it just hits me. It hits me because what 
someone has to go through in order to you know, mentally and spiritually to be able to handle something like that at 26 years old. It's just, it's massive, man. It's just, oh man, it's just, uh, I feel for people and, you know, unfortunately, in our culture, one of the things that people want is a quick fix, and that's why people go get flu shots. That's why people go get vaccines. That's why people go to the store, to the pharmaceutical, you know, pharmacy, and go get, you know, a, a pill for every ill, like Chris said, you know, like a a pill for your headache or something, because it's really difficult to figure out why you're having that headache in terms of a, even a physical thing, let alone spiritually. You know, are you? Are you holding trapped emotions in your body? Are you holding on to something that you need to let go of? I mean, this is all deep spiritual work. Um, a lot of this deep spiritual, emotional work, reconnection work, reconnecting with yourself, reconnecting with God, reconnecting with the earth and becoming plugged into all that stuff so that you have an understanding of what's going on in your body. People don't want to do that. It's, it's too hard. It's too much work. So we'd rather live a completely disconnected life from ourselves, from others, from God, from the earth. And then when something comes up, take a little pill uh, and to get rid of it or take a shot instead of doing the hard work, instead of doing the necessary work that we, that we should all be doing throughout the day. And that's the thing. This work that we do uh, to be healthy, it's not, it's not difficult. It's so not difficult. Last night, I, um, I've been really getting into, as many of you guys know, uh, Rishi and Shaga mushroom, the medicinal, powerful mushrooms that um, the Chinese have been using for thousands of years. And they're the two most powerful mushrooms on the planet. And so recently I bought some uh, chunks of shaga, arrived on the door. And last night I put a bunch in a teapot. I cooked it up for a couple hours, let it simmer, let it brew. Um, and then I put the lid on, turned the stove off, went to bed. And now I've got a whole ton of shaga mushroom that will last me probably a week and a half. Excuse me. And, you know, it, it takes almost zero work to do these things. Um, I know some things are more work, especially if you have an, a, a really um, acute situation, you know, something going on where you got to do coffee enemas every day and that kind of thing, making a green juice. Sure, it's work, but it comes down to how much you value yourself and how much you put, how much you think you're worth in terms of why you're here on the planet. I mean, this. Being on the planet is a 400 trillion to one odd. I mean, you beat the odds 400 trillion to one that you exist. So you exist for a reason, right? So if you exist for a reason, what is that reason? And why don't you not exist anymore? Why did you die, you know, years ago? Well, there's obviously some kind of plan for you. There's obviously some kind of reason why you're here, right? So... Figuring that out and understanding that if God sees a reason for you and there's, or if you don't believe in God, then the universe or however you want to label these things, uh, has a reason for you being here, then there must be some good on the planet that you're supposed to be doing that you haven't tapped into yet. So if that's supposed to happen, then by not pursuing that, you're robbing all of those people that you're supposed to help. Right, because those people want to be helped by you and need to be helped by you, but we're not tapped in enough to know in what capacity we can help people. So, I mean, it gets it really does get in all this health stuff and all the stuff that we do. It sounds like oh, okay, you know, you just change your diet, you do raw paleo diet or vegan diet or whatever. You change your diet, you start taking you know supplements, and you do these things. And a lot of times, people think it's just purely physical, but when you really get to the meat of it. You really get down to the, to the brass tacks. It's, it's a spiritual journey, all this stuff. It's, it's all spiritual journey and, and awakening in that way and learning more and, um, reconnecting with God. And when you do that, you reconnect with yourself. You reconnect with others. You reconnect with the earth because we were never meant to get cancer. It's 26 years old. We just weren't, you know, we, we just weren't. It's, you know, it's our, it's, it's a lack of connection. I think that's, uh, one of the major causes of so many people being um, diagnosed these days. It's a lack of living in harmony uh, under God's laws and nature's laws and um, the universe's laws. It's lack of living in harmony and in connection with those things and being able to, to live closely to the land and closely to nature. Um, not saying that, you know, if you go out and live in nature, nothing bad is going to happen, 
But what I'm saying is that every aspect of our life has been completely hijacked in the sense that um, we're, we're just not connected to anybody anymore. And we don't even know our neighbors. And, you know, it's, it's just a weird, it's weird. It's really weird. And I think we've got way off course. And it's, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's really awesome to see Chris doing what he's doing. I, lo- I love it so much. <clears throat> excuse me, I got a bug in my throat. But I love what he's doing so much. And I'm super um, supportive of him. So if you know of anybody who um, is has been diagnosed with anything and are just sort of in flux or maybe newly diagnosed of, you know, um, you know, anyone dealing with cancer, send them this show and I hope it helps them. Uh, this will be, let me make sure I get this correct. Let me make sure our website, I think it is episode 507. I, I still can't believe that we've done 507 shows and all those shows are free. Uh, we're listener supported. So everything is free and you can just download them and listen to your heart's content from our website or from, um, iTunes or where, wherever you want to listen. Stitcher. We're on Stitcher as well or YouTube, but, um, I can't believe we've done 500 shows. That's nuts. Uh, very cool though. I'm so, so excited to be doing this and helping people in some way. So yeah, if you know of anyone, just send them to extremehealthradio.com slash 507 and uh, that will redirect them and we'll put the links to Chris's course as well as that that 20 questions um, that twenty questions document that he mentioned on the show. We'll put a link to that as well at extremehealthradio.com slash 507. And let me just share with you a couple things coming up. If I could get that. I can get that pulled up here. Uh, as many of you guys know, we do shows five days, I'm sorry, three days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Friday. So today, actually in a couple minutes, um, we're doing a special show with uh, Melissa Henning. Where she does a raw paleo diet. So she eats kind of like the primal diet that's uh, similar to Ogenus von der Planets, but she also does raw vegan along with raw animal foods. And I've been doing some animal, raw animal foods like eggs and butter, cheese, um, and let's see, raw milk. I used to do raw milk. I don't do raw dairy too much. I do ghee, and ghee's not a raw product, but I, ghee really agrees with me uh, more so than raw butter. But uh, then we have Leanne, Leanne Werner. She's going to be talking about the science um, behind the healing effects of red and near infrared biophotonic light therapy. I've been getting into that lately. Biophotonic red light. Um, been doing it on myself and um, got, got a lot of questions for her about light therapy and things. Then we got, let's see, Jesse Canone from Natural Back Pain. So if you know of anyone with back pain, um, we're going to be talking with him pretty soon. Uh, Shan Jones, the good skin solution, natural healing for eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, and acne. And then we've got Dr. Cass Ingram. We're going to be talking with him about the cold uh, or the colds and flu. Lots going on here at Extreme Health Radio. So as I said before, we're 100% listener supported. If you would like to send us a donation or sign up via PayPal or Patreon and give to the show on an ongoing basis, we would appreciate that. That would be awesome. It would be very much appreciated. We have so many, so many um, bills to pay here, internet connections, and we're looking to get internet connection in our studio as well. So maybe one day we can do live shows, live video in our studio, but uh, that costs uh, 300 bucks a month minimum uh, for the bandwidth that we need and uh, getting commercial internet here in Southern California. It's pretty crazy. So... Um, we can do that one day and we can do all that as, um, as a way of, um, if you donate to the show. So, but no, no problem. If you can't donate, we have a great thing on our, on the side of our website. Now, uh, many of you have been supporting us via Amazon lately, and we are just so thrilled and so happy that you're doing that. Uh, one of the things that we did is set up a really easy way for you to do that. And that is, uh, if you go to the right hand side of extremehealthradio.com, and you only have to do this one time, uh, one time, and that will support us on Amazon um, into the future with every purchase that you make. Uh, you'll see an Amazon banner on the right-hand side, and below that, there's some blue text that says, click and drag me to your desktop. And if you do that um, on your computer, um, probably on a iPad too, I'm not sure, um, but pretty much any computer, you can drag that icon off of the sidebar, I'm sorry, drag that text below the the banner right onto your desktop and that'll create an icon on your desktop. And then if you use that icon to make all your upcoming purchases, 
that supports the show through our affiliate link. Nothing changes for you. You still just go to amazon.com like normal, but we will get a commission and that's an awesome way to support us. Um, so we appreciate that a lot. Um, so all of our shows can remain free, all 507 of them. Um, also, we're also starting a membership site community here in 2017 too, where we're going to be diving deeper, much, much deeper than we do on the show and coming up with strategies, protocols, and all kinds of really, really unique information for people to, um, to get access to, to be able to overcome any kind of health condition. And we're going to be adding to that over time. So it's going to be a paid membership, so it won't be for everybody. But what I will say is that uh, there's going to be a big discount um, on the first week that we launch that. So if you want access, and it's going to be a lifetime access, so it's a monthly program um, that you'll have access to, um, there's going to be a massive discount at the beginning, and that will be a, a lifetime discount uh, forever as long as you stay signed up. And the price probably will go up over time, I would imagine. So um, if you get in on that first week, um, that will be a you know, way to save a lot of money. And we're going to have webinars. We're going to have coaching. We're going to have live uh, Q&A calls, possibly, depending on what you guys want. Uh, we're going to have access to um, people, people, doctors, and different people to be able to answer your health questions individually. Um, and we're going to have a forum. And potentially one day, too, we're going to be having live conferences and in in person events and things like that. So lots of cool stuff going on. If you want access to that uh, right now, we're just, all you got to do is sign up and put your name and email address in and we'll let you know when we launch that. So that'll be launching pretty soon. You can get access to that at extremehealthradio.com slash 507. Thank you also for supporting us in our store. Um, amazing. Thank you guys. We really appreciate it. Uh, we sell blenders, juicers, rebounders, Qigong programs, saunas, all kinds of really cool and unique um, cutting edge health products in our store. And, um, so next time you're going to buy something like that, um, consider going through our store and seeing if we offer it there, uh, on our store and then going through our link and that will help support the show too. Lots of cool stuff there in our store. And we're going to be adding to that as time goes on. So thank you for your support. You guys rock. I love you guys. Um, you're amazing. Thank you so much. Let us know if we can ever help. And, um, I will catch you guys on the next show. No material on this blog is intended to suggest that you should not seek professional medical care. Always work with qualified medical professionals, even if you educate yourself in the field of live food, nutrition, and alternative medicine. I'm not a doctor, nor am I offering readers medical advice of any kind. None of the information offered here should be interpreted as a